This budget speech was illuminated by BrightRock, the first ever needs matched life insurance that changes as your life changes. I'm Linda van Tolbuk for Biz News. Finance Minister Enoch Godendwane presented his medium term budget in Parliament today. The country's public finances were significantly weaker, he said, due to disappointing tax revenues and rising costs to service debt. The government expects to collect 57 billion rand less tax than it anticipated in the February budget. And with me in the studio to, to discuss that is Chief Economist at the Efficiency Group, Darby Ritt. Hi, Darby. Welcome Hi, to business. Nice talking to you. So I'm not sure this is like a good day to, for you. What is the overall impression of Mr. Gordon Dwana's midterm budget speech? Okay, well, first of all, it's not a budget speech as such. It's just an opportunity for the Minister of Finance to bring us sort of up to speed on what's been happening the past couple of months in terms of the economy and in terms of fiscal finances as well. So he's going to give us a lot of numbers, and that's what he's done. And he's uh, told us what the and he, uh, between the lines, he gave us a bit of a hint to what can be expected in an actual budget, which will be uh, presented in, in February next year. But my overall impression is that the minister is far too optimistic. Uh, he's talking about economic growth of 1.8%, for example, or rather 0.8%. I don't think we're going to see that. And for subsequent years, he also see economic growth growing close to about 2% in two or three years hence. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, then, and something else that I'm actually quite much more concerned about, that this is not something new. It started happening in February already. And that is that I am not really convinced that I should believe the fiscal deficit and the fiscal debt numbers, for example, because there are a number of um, items not included in the deficit numbers, and which he also did not include in the February budget. Like, for example, the transfer of 256 billion rand to Transnet, uh, to, to ESCOM, uh, that is supposed to be included in the fiscal deficit and definitely is supposed to be included in the fiscal debt numbers going forward, and it's just not there. So, and I may have actually pointed that out, and still he did not include that in his estimates. Now, additional to that, we know that the local authorities are in very deep trouble, and that the local authorities, he did say that he will, can take over, he will write off, to use his words, about 20 billion rand to off their debt, um, if they do A, B, and C, and that's also not included in, in the deficit or in the debt numbers any. Anyway. The same goes for Translet. He said Translet is not going to get money. Uh, we will make some sort of plan. We will cross that bridge when we get there next year. But Translet is going to get money because without Translet, this economy is not going to work. Uh, and it doesn't matter what conditions he puts on the table. Trans he will give money to Translet because we simply cannot afford Translet not to work. Um, and that uh, none of those numbers are included in the deficit or in the debt numbers either. Uh, so all in all, I think uh, the numbers are the actual numbers. Uh, the way that the Reserve Bank hopefully is going to report that will look completely different to what the Minister of Finance is actually given us today. So, too optimistic in my way, and secondly, a bit economical with the actual economic numbers. So, do you have an estimate of what you actually think it should be? Yeah, the fiscal deficit, my uh, rough calculation is for a fiscal deficit on the current financial year of approximately 6.6%. That is what I've calculated. Now, he's got it at 4. 9%, if I remember correctly, or let's call it 5%. So it's not that far off, but it's still far off. But if you convert that to a debt to GDP, but, but again, there's a bit of a technicality here. Say, for example, if you want to take over ESCOM's debt, do you simply move ESCOM's debt from ESCOM's balance sheet to your own balance sheet, or do you put it into the fiscal deficit first before you put it into your, uh, your debt numbers? If you put it into the fiscal deficit first, then you're going to distort your fiscal debt numbers, uh, deficit numbers over time. But if you don't uh, put it via the fiscal deficit first and then into the debt numbers, then you're going to distort the debt numbers in any of it. So there, there's an argument that it should not be included in the deficit numbers and simply directly moved into the on the balance sheet of the Minister of Finance. But the, uh, the interest component of that debt, without a doubt, must be included in the deficit number. So something is wrong. Either the debt is wrong or the deficit is wrong or both could be wrong or whatever, but the way that the Minister of Finance is reporting on those are simply key. When he emphasised the reconfiguration of the and the structure and size of the state, do you actually see them doing that? Um, yes, and not because they want to, because they haven't got a choice here. Uh, that is actually the part of the good news, in the, the, as far as I'm concerned, the best news that I've heard in the speech of the Minister of Finance and that they're talking about consolidation. And that, uh, hopefully that will mean getting rid of many of the state departments. Remember, 
uh, the confidence in the South African uh, economy and, and the South African government is rock bottom. It's never been this. Long. So we need some, some, some sort of symbolic gesture from the state that there are serious in, in you know, uh, the, all these excesses that are being spent on the political leaders that they, they, they want to stop doing that. And I think a good symbolic gesture will be for the Minister of Finance to stop this VIP protection expenses, for example, which runs into the billions of rands. So that's not going to make a big difference. Let's be honest about that. The big difference is going to happen when you start cutting and cancelling some of departments or consolidating many departments and get rid of a lot of ministers and, a, and an army of deputy ministers. and that, That's what we really need. That needs to happen as well. And I, and I think some of that, at least, is going to happen. The big challenge to the Minister of Finance, of course, is that uh, there's an election around the corner. And you can't really cut back on state spending just before an election. Uh, talking about that, talking about elections, I also picked up, and I don't ask me exactly where it is, so I'm still working through all the documents, but I also did pick up uh, that the Minister of Finance actually mentioned that there will be an increase, probably in debt taxes next uh, next year. So I, I won't be surprised if there's some increases in taxes. And, uh, and I know he did say that he's not considering tax increases, but remember, it is possible to increase taxes without increasing taxes. Like, for example, in case of personal income taxes, you just have to do nothing, and then bracket creep will, will actually move you up into the brackets. So that's actually a tax increase. So I suspect that's the kind of tricks that the Minister of Finance is going to pull, uh, because an actual tax increase or actual significant cutback on tax expenditure just before an election is political suicide. So so would the in, an increase in VAT be? Yeah, well, VAT increase is the only increase that can really collect a, a significant amounts of extra money. A 1% increase in VAT will give you between 25 and 30 billion rand for a full annual, for a full financial year. So we need approximately 2% increase in VAT. But VAT, VAT is politically extremely sensitive because it is a regressive tax. Uh, but the, the other taxes are just not available. You can't increase company taxes. You can't really increase personal income taxes because uh, personal income taxes are very high and the same for company taxes. Actually, we need to reduce company taxes in South Africa. And our rich people are leaving. They are emigrating and they're taking money in the schools and uh, and the taxes with them as well. So we can't we can't increase taxes on, on, on the so-called rich anymore. They are basically the only taxpayers left in South Africa. Um, so how have the markets reacted to the budget? Well, I'm um, having a look at the financial markets. The right actually appreciated by something like 20 cents against the 15, 20 cents against the U.S. It's currently trading at 18.56 to the U.S. And the bond market also appreciated quite nicely. Um, I think uh, we have to remember when you talk about the financial markets is that the RAND is always undervalued. But recently it has been more undervalued than usual. Um, so it's well away from its the supposedly historic trend value. Um, and if nothing happens, the rand tends to sort of gradually drift a little bit better. So the, the, the very good news, well, good news for South Africa is when nothing happens, um, and because that will contribute, that will actually support the rand and sort of nudge the rand more to its historic trend levels. Now, I think the rand certainly did appreciate after what's happened today, and I think part of the reason is because not much happened. Uh, Everybody has been talking about these. Um, uh, doom and gloom and about the debt levels getting out of hand and that we have to be concerned to fall. And of course we have to. But the Minister of Finance sort of brushed over that and he didn't spend too much time on that. And I think the financial markets said, oh, maybe it's not that bad. Let's wait and see what's going to happen with Feb. So I guess that's part of the reason why the RAT appreciated against so, so do you think it's gen generally a wait and see? So he sort of said, yeah, we're going to trim back, we're going to cut some stuff, but it's sort of not very definite in, in, in any of the measures. It's not supposed to be very different uh, because this is only sort of a, just a medium term statement. And then the budget, the actual, the, the, the real the hard work is going to happen in February. And he will have to give us a lot of answers of what's going to happen in February. He must tell us what's going to happen to the local authorities because they're running out of money. Uh, and he, did, he actually mentioned that they're running out of money because people are generating their own electricity. So they don't sell electricity to people anymore. So what are we going to do with the local authorities? That's a question. Somehow we have to support the local authorities because if we don't do that, they're going to go bust. In fact, many of them are going falling over already as it is. We have to do something about Transnet. He must give us an answer about, about Transnet. He can't tell us there will be conditions um, to money that he's going to give to Transnet or Eskom and then conditions are going to A, B, and C and from now on they're going to pay interest on that. It doesn't, that, that doesn't mean anything. 
because we cannot live without Transnet. We cannot live without ESCO. And so we, we have to give money to them. And it doesn't matter whether they comply with the conditions or not. And he will give us, he need to give us answers to that and where, where the money is going to come from. And like I said earlier, so if you include all of these sort of figures, um, then, then, then the actual picture is not that pretty. It's actually significantly worse than what the Minister of Finance is trying to uh, paint here. Were you shocked about the share um, of the, the debt as a share of GDP that we're paying at the moment? Because I see it's one of the highest in the world, just below China. Yeah, to paying. You know, of course, I'm not going. To, I'm, I'm not surprised about that. We know about. We knew about these sort of things, uh, and I think the Minister of Finance, by actually putting it in a public domain and putting emphasis on that in this and putting it into the documents and rubbing it in under the noses of the politicians, I think the point he wants to make, which is right. Uh, it's correct, and that is that he wants to show to his colleagues that we are in deep trouble, you guys. Stop buying new fancy cars and buying houses and all these sort of We can't afford that. So, no, no, I was not uh, um, surprised about that. We, we, we've known about that for a long time. And it's not the South Africa's debt or even the interest on debt that's really the problem here. It's the rate at which it's changing. It is increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, and I think he's, the, the minister mentioned that debt will stabilize at around about 77, 77% of GDP in a year's time. I don't think so. I don't, certainly don't think so. If you look what the minister said in the February budget or what he said in last year's medium term and in last year's budget, you look at all those estimates, every time the deficit and the debt numbers far exceeded these estimates. So and this is what's going to happen this time around as well. So next year... He's going to tell us now that debt is going to stabilize at 80% of GDP in two years' time, something like this. So it, it keeps on slipping, those estimates of the minister. So, so, so he's not taking away the social grant. He's not taking away the COVID grant, the 350 That's, grand. I didn't expect him to do that. And I don't think he's going to take it away next year either. No, he's, uh, he, he's, he said it will be for another year. And it will be replaced by something else. There are approximately 8 million people receiving the COVID grant. There are approximately 18 million people receiving, 18, 19 million people receiving other grants. So we've got about 17 million people receiving grants in South Africa and approximately 2 million civil servants. So we've got close to about 30 million people get, getting an income from the state every month. Uh, and you can't give people money and then take it away, especially not before an election. So now I think that, that uh, the, the COVID grant will become a permanent fixture. And again, the minister didn't tell, how, tell us how that is going to be funded either. So, and that, of course, will be added to the fiscal deficit and to the debt and all of that as well. Um, there's a new mechanism announced to fund large infrastructure projects. And I, I think they, I see they want private sector and international finance institutions involved there as well. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, a good idea. The problem is, if we look at Transnet, for instance, in, in fact, they've already shortlisted one or two potential candidates to, for these public-private partnerships uh, on some of the railroads. But the private sector simply does not have much of an appetite for this because they argue that the uh, Minister of Transport or the government is only prepared to give them, say, a two-year contract, for example. And you can't invest many billions of rands into upgrading the infrastructure and maintaining the infrastructure and only get a, a contract for about for a few years. You need probably need decades kind of thing before it makes sense for you financially. So. But again, I think that we are probably going to see from the side of the state that they will become more realistic about the expectations of the private sector and more realistic in terms of of these various contracts. And you, I mean, who's going to be? You must you must be you must have a complete you must be completely crazy if you want to waste your shareholders' money on only two years contracts of running a railroad, for example. You need a long term contract in order to do this. But there's a lot of there's a lot of um, detail that need to be ironed out uh, before these kind of uh, agreements can be put into place. But I think eventually that's a good idea, and I think eventually it will be put in place. If it's not put in place, the private sector in many instances is simply doing it without the permission of the state. And I think electricity is a good example. The private sector is just generating their own electricity, and you don't need the state's permission to do that. And but what, what quite, quite often happens, and that's a problem to the local authorities, is that the private sector, because the local authorities are not paying ESCOM. The local authorities owe ESCOM some, something like 60 billion rand. And so what happens, ESCOM cuts off the electricity and businesses that have paid for the electricity usage to the municipalities, they get very angry at this. So they go to the courts and now they're buying electricity directly from ESCOM. 
So the local authorities can't get that electricity surcharge anymore, or they put down a, up their own solar system. So, so we are in a we in a transition period in South Africa. We we becoming far less dependent on the state for the provision of many of these things that the state provisionally provided to the economy. Electricity is just one example, but the same goes for post office, the same goes for the railroads and many other things. At the press conference at, um, with the media, he called himself Mr. Austerity. Is that an appropriate description of him now? No, certainly not. No, he's Mr. Expenditure. He's not Mr. Austerity. Um, what is an austere budget? Uh, an austere budget is where you're cutting back on state spending and where you really, um, you, you really squeeze uh, your budget in order to make sure that you don't get deeper into trouble. Uh, an austere budget is a budget that at least uh, matches state ex expenditure with the revenue. No, we're not nearly there. We've got the fiscal deficit, not only a fiscal deficit, a little one, we've got a huge fiscal deficit. So as long as the debt levels keeps on going up, you've got you don't have an austere budget. You've got a highly expansionary budget in South Africa. No, this is hugely expansionary. This is not close to an austere budget. An austere budget means actually cutting back on state spending and forcing the deficit down to zero. That is austerity. I'm not even talking about the budget surplus. Just bringing the fiscal deficit down uh, much more than we. Then that's talking about austerity. You know, what has happened in practice, the fiscal deficit actually went up. Now, you can't call that an austere budget, says no, certainly not. Maybe a message to his own government instead of the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, that's a big challenge to the Minister of Finance. And that is that how is he going to convince his colleagues that he needs to actually cut back on state spending when there's an election around the corner? And remember, many of these guys that are in cabinet, not only in national government and in parliament, but in the local authorities as well, and on provincial level, and many of the state on enterprises, many of them are there because of political connections, not because they should be there. So if the ANC loses elections, I'm afraid that a lot of people are going to be out of jobs and they're not going to find a job in the private sector. They're just not good enough. D D Davi Ritt, thank you so much. Was there anything else you would like to add to this? <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, Winston Churchill once said about the Americans, he said, you can always expect the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives. And that is what's going to happen in South Africa as well. Uh, the alternatives, we have to privatize because the state can't do that. And we are privatizing things, not because we want to, and certainly not because it's government policy, but because that is the only thing left to do. And those kind of things happen. And I guess in a way, that, and even the Minister of Finance, he said that we need to consolidate it. So we have to make a plan about the size of the state and state expenditure. So in the end, after after trying everything else, they seem to be doing the right thing now. So could, could you see the election hanging over all of this? Of course. Oh, certainly. I mean, the Minister of Finance a few months ago, he came out all guns blazing, telling his cabinet colleagues that he's got to cut back on state spending. And the next thing, he, he uh, backtracked quite a lot in the newspapers and everybody said, no, that's not what he meant and all that. No. He was hauled over the coals because of that state, because everybody got very, very scared all of a sudden, especially uh, organized labor in South Africa. And organized labor made it very clear they're not going to they not gonna sit on their hands if there's any real cuts in, on, in state expenditure, for example. So, no, no, no. Uh, his, uh, his colleagues are going to make it, and that's because of the like, election office. So, all eyes on the February budget to see what it, this really means. Yeah, the February budget's going to be a very tough, another very tough one for the Minister of Finance. That's an actual one. Now we want the real numbers. Uh, and that's, he will make, have to make decisions then because the election is probably going to be around about March, uh, uh, May right. or somewhere there. Uh, and the February uh, budget is just before that. So now this is going to be a real crunch time for the Minister of Finance. And I say, so, in a way, it's fun looking at it. You know, I always have fun looking at politicians really. Um, having Swimming. a difficult time. <laughs> <laughs> Will he not be able to kick the can down the road just till after the election? No, he, can't, he, can't, he simply can't do that because there's a, there's a budget before the elections. Um, and uh, what is also clear is that the ANC is losing support in South Africa. So, uh, yeah, that, that, this is a combination of all sorts of things. I think South Africa is in a transition phase where, we, be, like I've said, we're becoming less dependent on the state for all sort of things that traditionally state would provide, but we are also in a tr transition phase in, it, in, in the sense that we, we are changing politically as well. The ANC is losing a lot of support. 
And with a bit of luck in not the, this, not the next election, but the one day after, we will hopefully have a government that excludes the AIDS. Dobby Red, thanks to the economist. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. This budget speech was illuminated by BrightRock, the first ever needs-matched life insurance that changes as your life changes. <laughs>